Hi there, my name is Michael Hansen and I am the lead pastor here at Vineyard Church, Delaware County. I am so glad that you have joined us for our weekend podcast. I'm gonna have a little bit more to say later, but for now, enjoy the service.
Well, good evening. You can go ahead and have a seat. Welcome, welcome. Hey, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here at VCDC. So glad to be worshiping and just spending uh, this time with you guys. Um, welcome also to those of you joining us online today. Uh, super glad that you're, you're tuned in with us. Hey, just a reminder, uh, middle school students, you may go directly when you arrive to your classroom at every service. Uh, but if you're in the room right now, you can kind of make your way around to the youth room and head that way if you want to uh, head that way. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time, I know I saw, I saw a, new, a few new faces. We're so glad that you're here, and we would love to connect with you after the service. We, there's something called the info counter out in the lobby where we'd love to have you stop by and say hi and fill out something we call the connect card. It just gives us a little bit of information about yourself. We're not going to bug you or hound you. We just want to be able to reach out to you, start a conversation with you, say thank you for coming, and it's a great way if you have any questions to just kind of start a dialogue with that as well. So uh, make sure you do that. If you're new and joining us online, you can just send us an email at info at vcdc.org. Let us know you're new and we'll reach back out as well. Giving. If you came wanting to give, we're not going to be passing a basket around, but there are boxes in the back by the double doors um, that you are welcome to drop off anything that you wanted to give. Uh, but you can also give online at vcdc.org as well. If you want to turn your attention to the screens, we're going to have, Jay is going to bring our announcements for this week. Hey, VCDC. I'm Jay McKinley. I'm one of the youth pastors at VCDC. Here are this week's announcements. If you're newer to BCDC and want to explore your next steps, then join us at Quick Connect in the cafe this weekend after each service. We'll be holding a vision and values class on Zoom on Thursday, November 12th at 7 p.m. This is VCDC's path to membership. To register, email us at info at vcdc.org. Our feature small group this week is Uniquely His, led by Matt and Deb Crane. They're currently meeting in person in the church building on the first, second, and third Wednesday at 7 p.m. We have a variety of men's, women's, and mixed groups that meet in person and on Zoom. You can find info on all of them either on our website or on the small group card wall in the lobby. Please call the leader before you visit to confirm how and when they are meeting. That's all for this weekend. Enjoy the rest of the service. Great. Thanks, Jay. Short and sweet. Uh, we, uh, every week we pray for a different church in the area, and this week we're praying for Grace Point Community Church. It's in Lewis Center. It's led by Pastor Terry Lewis. And I, if I'm correct, I think they just like reopened in-person services like last weekend. So let's pray for them. So Lord, we thank you for Grace Point Community. We, we pray just blessing on them. We pray that you would just be with them during this process of you know, beginning this journey of, of reopening. Uh, and we just ask that you would care for them, meet their needs, uh, bless that church family, and we just pray that your presence would be with them and among them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, please join me in welcoming up our lead pastor, amen. Michael Hansen. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> hey, good evening and uh, good morning to those of you online. Hey, before I get into my talk, on Wednesday, I believe, it is Remembrance Day, and we would just love to honor, uh, if you are serving or have served in the military, would you please stand so that we can applaud you and honor you? All right. So bless you. Thank you for your service. That's awesome. Bless you guys. All of you. Hey, and one more thing is we have some special guests here uh, this evening. Uh, if you want to stand up, we have Todd and Michelle Rosenwald and their lovely family are right back here. If you guys want to, there they are in the corner. Welcome you guys. These, uh, we're really in a clapping mood. That's great. Hey, so Todd, Michelle and their family, they are missionaries in China. They started an organization called His Feet International many years ago. And after the service this evening, right over here in the youth room, we're having a pizza party uh, meet and greet um, you can get there either through these doors or down the hallway. But uh, if you want to check that out, I would strongly encourage you. They're going to be sharing a bit more about what they do in China. They work with uh, leprosy quarantine villages, uh, persecuted believers, and lots of other special 
projects caring uh, for people in need. So they are an awesome family doing an awesome work. And so I encourage you to check that out. And did I mention there will be pizza? Mm. So thanks. It's great to have you guys here uh, with us. All right. We're in a series. uh, We have been for quite a few weeks now called Resilient. And we're looking at the life of a man, an Old Testament character named Joseph. And I find this interesting considering the series. The word resilient means this. It means able to withstand or recover quickly from different conditions. And if you're familiar with this series, uh, this guy, Joseph, has had many difficult conditions to uh, recover from. What we've seen in his life, uh, there's been this constant theme that whatever comes his way, whatever difficult conditions, highs and lows, the theme in Joseph's life is a constant trust in uh, God through it all. And that's where his resilience comes from, his kingdom resilience. And if you remember the quote we've been referring to, kingdom resilience is taking one more step with God. And let me just take a little step away from my notes. Uh, You may have noticed there's a little bit of friction over a certain election uh, that's been going on, if you've, uh, unless you've been asleep for a long, long time. But you know, uh, you may be pleased, frustrated, disappointed, angry, all of the above right now. But either way, as I look at what we're going through as a nation, uh, as I look at what, at what we're going through as followers of Jesus, we have an amazing opportunity right now in what we're going through to grow in kingdom resilience. We have an amazing opportunity to literally take a step with God. Here's what I mean. Here's a great prayer to be praying right now. Oh, Lord. (laughs) Lord, I pray blessing, protection, and wisdom to lead this nation on on whoever is going to end up being the president. But God, I also say this. My hope is not in him. My hope is in you. That's taking a step with God. And... So I want to encourage you, that's a simple prayer, but when the emotions rise up, just turn to the Lord. That's taking a step with him, and you're going to grow in your kingdom of resilience. Okay, now back to my notes. I just had to get that off my chest because it's obvious in the room. I'm cutting it a little thick here. Okay, so up to this point, uh, the focus has been on Joseph. What we're going to look at tonight, the camera's going to pan back and... His 10 older brothers are going to join him in the frame, if you will. The brothers don't know it. Joseph doesn't know it yet. But God is getting ready to uh, reunite this family. But before he does, he has to deal with uh, an issue from the past. Uh, And you've got one, you've got two parties, obviously. You've got one who was the offender in in this issue, and that would be the brothers. Then you've got one who was the, uh, the one who was offended, and that's Joseph. And if you're familiar with the story, remember the last time Joseph saw his brothers, uh, they were deciding whether or not to kill him. And I would call that, I have three older brothers, I would call that a bit of an issue. And uh, in the end, they graciously decided to sell him into slavery. So in what we're going to look at tonight, what we're going to see is God is working in Joseph, in his life, <clears throat> helping him move from, from forgiveness to reconciling with his brothers. And then God is going to be working in the heart of the brothers to move them from repentance to reconciling with Joseph. Uh, What I want to focus on tonight is, and what I want you to see is that God really values and really gets all the challenges of relationships. God's very aware that in this life, you're going to have lots of opportunities to be the offender, and you're going to have lots of opportunities to be the offended Uh, marriage, family, uh, friendships at work, business partners at school, at church, small group, and of course, during elections. And, uh, but listen to this, God knows this. God knows that when you offend another person, when you sin against someone else, God knows that there is a weight that drops on your shoulders, right? A weight of guilt that you were not built to carry. He also knows that when you're the one being sinned against, when you're the one that's offended, he knows that when that happens, there is a weight of wanting to be the judge, jury, and executioner that drops on your shoulders. And again, that is a weight that we were not built to carry. And so what we're going to see tonight is that God wants to really meet us in those heavy relational places, if you will, and help us to uh, lay those weights 
down, the weights that we weren't built to carry. So within the context of this series, it's called Resilient. Uh, I've tweaked our quote for the series. Instead of kingdom resilience, I've changed it just for this weekend to kingdom relational resilience is taking one more step relationally uh, with God. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll look at the story. So Lord, <clears throat> I thank you that, uh, that you reign over the heavens and the earth. And I don't understand all that's going on right now. But I thank you that you are reigning over this country right now. And I pray that you would protect this country. Lord, I pray that truth, I just pray for the truth, Lord. But, but in the end, wherever it goes, we put our trust in you. And I thank you that you're with us tonight. And, and, and even tonight as we gather, we put our trust in you that you know what we need. And you're a God who is able to to communicate with everybody in this room. So we welcome all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so get this. We're gonna go through three chapters tonight. It's actually 106 verses. So, have you ever heard an auctioneer? No, okay, here we go. Here's, so to set the stage, last weekend, Andrew uh, talked a lot about how uh, we learned that Egypt, the Middle East, was experiencing a severe famine. But thankfully, you know, God raised Joseph up. God gave Joseph wisdom. You know, he was a resilient leader, and, and uh, Egypt planned for this, and they set aside all this grain uh, to, to feed them, uh, to get them and others through this famine. And so let's start in chapter 42, verse 1. We'll get into the story here. When Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you standing around looking at one another? I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. Okay, famine has reached Canaan, <clears throat> where Jacob, uh, his boys, and their families live. And you know, I think it's fair to assume that, uh, that the fact that there was food available in Egypt would have, uh, would have been common knowledge. There's a famine going on. News like that would have, would have spread really uh, quickly. So Jacob, as he says to his boys, why are you standing around looking at one another? I think really what he's getting at is this. He's asking, hey, sons, why are you hesitating to go down to Egypt? We need food. Why are you hesitating? And I wonder if the son's hesitation, I wonder if it didn't come from guilty consciences. I wonder, again, we're thinking of the 10 older brothers. I wonder if the thought of going to Egypt was triggering guilt in their hearts. It's now been a little over 20 years since they sold their little bro, Joe, uh, to slave traders who were headed to Egypt. And isn't this the truth about, uh, about guilt, right? One of, the, one of the crazy things about guilt is you can, you can push guilt down. You can, you know, move it all around. You can try to cover it up with all kinds of things, but, but on our own, we just can't make it go away. And all it takes is if you hear someone's name or if, you know, a certain event in the family is brought up, or in this case, they hear the word Egypt, and boom, no matter how deep you thought that guilt was buried, it's right there on the surface. And so these guys, I think they're experiencing a lot of guilt as they hear about Egypt, but either way, they need to eat, so off they go. Uh, they head off to Egypt, and this sets up their first meeting with Brother Joseph. Let's read in verse 6. It says this. Since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed before him with the face, their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. But he pretended, not, he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from, he demanded. From the land of Egypt, uh, Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he'd had about them many years before. He said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Okay, we'll stop there. So here come the brothers. Uh, bowing down before Joseph. He recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And that totally makes sense. He's now, you know, he, last time they saw him, he was 17. Now he's like 37, 38 years old. You know, he's the prime minister. He's dressed in very fancy Egyptian clothes. He's clean shaven as Egyptians would have been. And, and he's in a position of authority 
that his brothers like, could never had imagined that he would be in. Because when they last saw him, they were selling him into slavery. And can you imagine Joseph standing there and his brothers bowing down before him? If you're familiar with the story, Joseph, like that's like major deja vu. Joseph dreamt that when he was a teenager. His brothers bowing down before him one day. In fact, that was one of the reasons his brothers were so angry with, uh, at Joseph. And I'm sure uh, seeing his brothers there bowing down before him, I am sure that his heart was exploding with lots of emotions. Lots of strong emotions. And there, there had to be something inside him that just wanted so badly to say, hey, it's me. It's me, Joseph. But if you look at the story, he, he doesn't do that. In fact, he, you know, through an interpreter, he accuses them of being spies. And I'm like, why would you do that, Joseph? And so this week, you know, I, normally when I prep, I'll read different commentaries, smart people who write about scripture. And one of them said this. He said, oh, what's going on here is Joseph is just having fun with his brothers. I'm like, uh, it's a little weak. Uh, and what another one said, uh, jo- what's going on here is Joseph is getting revenge on his brothers. So he's, you know, he's being hard on them. And I look at that and I go, both of those really, I disagree with them because they're so out of character of Joseph. I mean, you think of this series. We've literally, uh, we've, we've watched Joseph grow up. We've watched him learn to be kingdom resilient. And that resilience has come from him learning to live a life with a belief in a dependence on a submission to God and his ways. And, and I believe what we see going on here is literally God who, think of the story, God has spoken to Joseph so many times in interpreting dreams. Right? So he's familiar with God's voice. I believe that God spoke to Joseph and literally gave him divine guidance, gave him a plan. You know, maybe it went something like this. I doubt it, but maybe. Joseph, you don't know it yet, but I am getting ready to reunite you with your brothers. But before I can do that, there's something in your heart, Joseph, that needs to be dealt with. So Joseph accuses them and says, you're spies. And the brother's like, what? We're not spies. And they say, we're honest men. And I'm sure Joseph is like, really? And so he gives them a test. In verse 15, he says this to his brothers. This is how I will test your story. One of you must go and get your brother, Benjamin. We'll talk about him in a sec. A sec. <laughs> I'll keep the rest of you here in prison. Then we'll find out whether or not your story is true. And again, Joseph has 10 older brothers. They're half brothers from different mothers. Uh, but Benjamin, Benjamin's his, his, his little brother, and he's his, Benjamin is his full brother. They are both from Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. So Benjamin is very special to Joseph. And, and understand the test that he's given his brothers has nothing to do with them being spies. He knows them. It, they're my brothers, right? What the test is all about is, are you guys honest men? Or more, more accurately, what Joseph is trying to find out is, have you guys changed? And what have you done to my little brother? Because I know what you did to me. So how have you treated Benjamin? I want to see Benjamin, and I want to see, have you guys changed? These are questions in Joseph's heart that need to be answered before reconciliation can happen. So uh, in the next part of the story, as it progresses, we really, in both Joseph and his brothers, we see a little bit of movement in their hearts towards uh, reconciliation. After hearing this test that Joseph gives them, the brothers you know, huddle up together, and it says this in verse 21. Speaking among themselves, they said, clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we're in this trouble. Didn't I tell you not uh, not to sin against the boy, Reuben, who's the oldest, asked, but you wouldn't listen. And now we have to answer for his blood. And this is such a cool part. Verse 23, of course, they didn't know that Joseph understood them. He spoke Hebrew. He knew exactly what they were saying. For he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. Now, hearing what they just said, he turned away from them and he began to weep. And so, boy, see, that's my cue, to weep. But, it's, but I look at that and I, and I think I get stirred up because, man, that's a lot of drama. And that's heavy, heavy going on right there. For the brothers to move towards reconciliation, 
they first, uh, they first need to move towards repentance. And what we see going on in the brothers and what they said is that God is working in these guys' hearts. And he's totally convicting them for what they did. And the conviction is leading to this confession that they're giving. And like, so they're really moving on this path towards repentance. Uh, they're starting to own their sin, which is always a good thing. And another really good thing is empathy. Empathy is growing in their hearts. They're like, oh man, we saw his anguish. Like, this is our little brother. We heard his cries and we did nothing about it. How could we have done such a thing? And then you've got Joseph. For him to move towards reconciliation, there first needs to be forgiveness. And just imagine, I mean, that's why I love the drama of this. Can you imagine Joseph standing in the room acting like he can't understand his brothers? And he's hearing them confess what they did to him, right? And, and, and when I look at that, and when you look at his, at his response, I mean, I, it doesn't surprise me that he runs out of the room and he goes to a corner somewhere and he weeps. Listen to this quote from Warren Wiersbe. What makes a person weep is a good test of character. In hearing their confession, he doesn't fly into a vengeful rage. You know, guilty, I'm gonna stick it to you now. He doesn't do that. What does he do? Joseph weeps. So what does the weeping tell us about Joseph? It tells us that over the years, God has helped him forgive his brothers for what they did to him. And his forgiveness has made room in his heart to love his brothers again. And you know, the Bible tells us as Christians, we are commanded to, uh, to forgive others as we've been forgiven by God. And if you're a note taker, that's a, uh, Ephesians 4.32. You can check that out later. But you know, and, and as the offended party, forgiving the other person is as much for our own good as it is for the other. Listen to this. Forgiveness is a choice to release the offender, to release the offense to God, to give it, to give the person, to give the offense over to God, recognizing that God alone is the judge, not us. You're not the judge, I'm not the judge. Why is that? Because only God has the right, the perspective, the wisdom, and the authority to judge and discipline the offender. See, as the offended party, what I'm talking about right there, that's the weight I'm talking about that we were not built to carry. If you're trying to function as the judge, jury, and executioner with the people who have hurt you, it's going to damage you. It's going to hurt you. And so through forgiving, through giving it over to God, right, we literally are letting go and laying down that weight that we're not built to carry. You may have heard it said this way, uh, uh, as Christians, forgiveness has no strings attached, but reconciliation can have many strings attached. And if you think about what reconciliation is, it's when you've got two parties that have been at odds and now they're brought back together, they're reunited. But what if someone has, uh, has lied to you? What if your business partner stole from you? Right? What, if, what if your spouse physically hurt you? What if, what if, you know, in school your friend stabbed you in the back, meaning with words, like literally talked behind your back. See, when we talk about reconciliation, there may be, may be lots of steps needed. There may be lots of time required before you're able to trust that person and able to be reconciled with them. And in some cases, wisdom would say, you may never reconcile with the person who hurt you. So Joseph, while, while I think it's pretty obvious he's forgiven his brothers, he is not yet at the place of reconciling with them. Because he's got some questions like, have you changed? Can I actually trust you guys? So, uh, story progresses. The brothers head back to Canaan. Uh, they're, you know, on their donkeys. And they got big sacks of grain. And they don't know it. But Joseph asked his attendant to put their money back in their sacks. And they don't discover that till they're a long ways, you know, away from Egypt. And one of the brothers goes to get some food. And look at their response when they find the money back in their sacks of grain. Verse 28 says, look, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here in my sack. Then their hearts sank. Trembling, they said to each other, oh, what has God done to us? And you know, when I read that, what went through my mind is, what has God done to you? He's blessed you. He's given you your money back, but they don't see it that way, do they? In fact, I would say they can't see it that way. Why is that? Unconfessed sin 
A guilty conscience can blind us and keep us from recognizing and receiving God's goodness. Like, remember, kingdom resilience, kingdom resilience comes from living a life, you know, taking those steps with God, but living a life where you believe that God is with you and God is for you. Like, that's the kind of relationship with God we were made for. And if you look back at the beginning of Genesis, that's, that's how it was. Adam and Eve had this awesome relationship with God in the garden. You know, walking in the Garden of Eden, and it's, it's more than just taking a, you know, resilience is taking a, another step with God. In their case, it was, you know, going for an evening stroll with God in the garden. But look what happens to their relationship with God when Adam and Eve sin. Genesis 3 verse 8 says this, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they ran to him and told him all the cool things that they learned that day. No, they didn't. They were guilty. They, had the, they were carrying the weight of guilt. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. See, a guilty conscience causes us to, to avoid God. Right? It causes us to literally distrust God. So them finding money back in their sacks of grain really was a gift from God, something to be celebrated, but it was something that they feared. And, and this is, this, this, we find this out later, you know, when the, you know, the boys go back to Canaan with the food and the money and with Joseph's order, hey, next time you come to Egypt, you better bring your little brother. And while they're there, they, you know, they, they eat all the food and they have to go back to Egypt. So off they go back to Egypt with Benjamin, with little brother, and they also go back to Egypt with a plan to plead their innocence regarding the money. But when they get back to Egypt, they don't want to talk to Joseph because they're scared of Joseph. Uh, so they go talk to his attendant to plead their case about the money. And look at the attendant's response. He's like, you guys, you're not in trouble. Verse 23, he says, relax. Don't be afraid. The household manager told them, your God, the God of your father, must have put this treasure into your sacks. I know because I received your payment. Like, who do you think paid this guy? Joseph. Joseph would have paid them. You know, some of us this evening uh, in this room, maybe uh, some of you watching online, some of us have, because of guilty consciences, we see the presence of God as something to be avoided, as something to hide from. But, but, it's just the opposite. You know, if you are here this evening or if you're watching online and you know the weight of a guilty conscience, know that God who's with us right now, he is not here to punish you. He's not here like, you know, to rub your nose in what you did. God is here to love you. God is here to pour his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness on you. And literally, God is here to melt away the barrier that you think exists right now between, between you and God. And we, we sort of see that process going on with the brothers. That, you know, there's, you know it's, it, they're now having dinner with Joseph, and they're starting to relax. and like, well, maybe we're not in trouble. Maybe this isn't going to be so bad. And, and, it, and it goes so well that the evening ends with verse 34 that says, so they feasted and drank freely with him. And again, it's going so well. Don't you think Joseph, at this point of the story, was so tempted to say, hey, hey, you guys, it's me. It's me, Joseph. But again, he doesn't do it. And he doesn't do it because there's one more test. There's one more test to see if his older brothers really had changed. So after their, you know, their dinner with, with Joseph, the next morning they all get up. All 11 of them fire up their donkeys. And, and they're heading back to Canaan. They're loaded up with grain. And again, they don't know it, but their money is back in these sacks of grain. And this time there's a twist and the twist is this, Joseph asked his attendant, hey, take my personal silver cup and put it in Benjamin, the youngest, put it in his sack of grain. And so the, you know, the brothers take off and they're just about onto the I-5 when uh, Joseph sends his attendant after them. And he catches up to them and, and when he does, he accuses them like, how dare you? You know, we were so good to you. And, you're, and, and uh, accuses them of stealing the cup. And the brothers are like indignant at this guy. And they're like, that's impossible. We would never have done that. And they're so sure of their innocence that they said to him, look, you can search all these sacks of grain. Whoever sack you find that cup in, if you do, you can kill that brother. And the rest of us will be your slaves. 
And the attendant, and this is really important in the story, the attendant looks at them and goes, okay, take it easy. <laughs> no need to kill anybody. And he basically says, look, how about this? Whoever has the cup will become my slave, and the rest of you are free to go home. Of course, he searches their, their sacks of grain, and of course, he finds it in Benjamin's sack. And the brothers are like, no, no, not Benjamin. It says in verse 13, when the brothers saw this, they tore their clothing in despair. Then they loaded their donkeys again and returned to the city. And here comes the final test, right? The test is this. Joseph is wondering, okay, you guys, your words show, your words show that you have changed, right? I heard your confession, but what about your actions, right? Will your actions show that you have changed? And really what he's getting at is, are you, are you going to abandon my little brother right now? Because you have a chance to do that. Are you going to abandon my little brother the way you abandoned me? And see, what Joseph is getting at is he's <clears throat> there. What he's getting at is the difference between remorse and repentance. There's a big difference. Remorse is a selfish sadness. Remorse is a sadness not because of what you have done, but because you got caught at what you were doing. But repentance is very different. Repentance is a humble sadness that owns what you've done and is willing to do whatever it takes to make things right. Listen to this poem. Tis not enough to say I'm sorry and repent and then go on from day to day just as we always went. Repentance is to leave the sins we loved before and show that we in earnest grieve by doing them no more. Is it just words of repentance or are, will there also be actions of repentance? And when, and when we come to this last test, it is so fitting that, that the one who, who takes that final test, who basically speaks on behalf of all the brothers, that the one who does it is Judah. And it's so important that it, it's so fitting that it's Judah because this is the brother back in 37, chapter 37, who originally decided to abandon their little brother Joseph and then to, you know, into the hands of slave traders. But Judah has changed. Listen to this, 44, 32 says this. He's talking to Joseph. My Lord, I guaranteed to my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. Well done, Judah. Judah passes the final test. He is a changed man, both in his words and in his actions. And you know, it's at this point in the story where God says to Joseph, now, now, Joseph, now this family, now these brothers can finally be reconciled. And then, you're going to have to wait till next week for that story. Uh, Heather's gets to, Heather gets the really nice part. But why don't we all stand up? I'm going to, we're going to end this way. Uh, we're actually going to end by taking communion together. So the, there you guys, good job. And if you need communion elements, they're at the back on the tables. And you know, here, here's what I realized. I realized I just blasted through a long story, but I did it. Um, and honestly, I, I'm not sure how many people this talk is for this weekend. And, but here's what I do know. I know that tonight in the room, I know that tonight online, whoever's watching, that there are people that are carrying weights. Uh, uh, you're carrying weights that you were not built to carry. For some of you, that may be the weight of guilt. It may be something that happened recently it may be something that happened years ago, like, like, in, like in the story we're looking at, where you have wronged someone, and you're very aware that you carry a weight of guilt. Or for others, it may be the weight of offense. You know, you're the one who was, who was wrong. You've been hurt. Uh, you want justice. You want revenge. And that is also a weight. You're carrying a weight, again, that you weren't built for. And both those weights are hurting both sets of people. And no matter what you do, you can push them down, you can move them around, you can try to bury it, but you just can't make it go away on your own. But tonight I have really good news, because you can't make it go away, but Jesus can. 
Jesus can lift that weight away from you and he wants to help you do that. And you know, it's such a simple process, hard but simple, that the way that we unload those weights, it's through confession. We confess them. We, we confess them to the Lord. We tell him what we did, right? We, we, can, we invite the Lord into the process to say, you need to help me forgive because I can't. Or you need to help me confess because I just can't do it on my own. We need to admit it to God. We need to invite him into it. We need to give it over to God, the guilt, the offense. And, and as we go back into worship after communion, I want to encourage you, if that's you, I want to encourage you to start that conversation uh, with God. But we're going to do this to prepare ourselves for communion. We're going to read a couple of verses together. Why don't, we, why don't we throw those up, Jim? Let's read this together. Here we go. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Let's pray. So Lord, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for your body broken and your blood poured out. And I thank you for the level ground at the foot of the cross where your grace and your mercy is offered to all, be they offender or offended. And I pray, Jesus, you'd come real close right now as we commune with you through the simple exercise of remembering the cross, of remembering what you did. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave thanks. He said, this is my body which was broken for you. Whenever you eat this, eat this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. Mm. Lord, I thank you that your word says it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And I just so sense your presence and your love in this room right now. And I just ask for more, Jesus. Come overwhelm our guilt. Come overwhelm our remorse. Lord. Come overwhelm our anger, our wounds. Come overwhelm all of those with your perfect love. Just come, Lord. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Whenever you drink this, drink this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. So we're going to go back into worship. And I just encourage you just to, uh, if, if you need to, start that conversation with the Lord. But as we worship, as God moves around the room, uh, if you feel like he gives you a word, a picture, a scripture that might be for the larger group, just come on over here to, to Andrew and uh, share it with him. But let's worship, and then uh, we'll pray in a little bit here. So we're going to sing a song that's usually very celebratory and upbeat. But over the past few weeks, as I've been driving in my car or working, I've just had the words of this song just rolling through my head, and I've just sung it really slowly to the Lord, just kind of like a prayer, and let the words just sink in. So that's what we're going to do, just sing this as a prayer. You may even want to extend your hands just to, as an act of saying, I love you, Jesus, and I also receive your love. Sing, there were walls between us. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down.
Oh, 
that's all we need to stand in. I sing of your love. tries to roll, when darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, oh I won't be shaken, no I won't be shaken, sing that again. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance So we're just going to take some time to, to pray for each other. And, and let me start by saying, if you're here tonight and you are sick, well, if you have a fever, you must leave the room. No, but if you're here tonight and you have pain in your body, <laughs> we would love to pray for you. So I'm going to open just a general invitation for prayer. 
But, you know, I had two pictures, obviously with the theme of, of the, uh, the talk. But as we started to worship, I just saw, I just saw Jesus, his, his arms came down like this, like they were massive in front, and blood just flowed into the room. And instantly, uh, the old hymn, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And I just feel like there is just such a, just a wide generosity of God, just a forgiveness for people to, to be forgiven and washed clean. And maybe it's the first time, maybe you've never started a relationship with Jesus, but I want to invite you that he's inviting you into a relationship and no matter what you've done, he has more than covered that with what he did and accomplished on the cross. So that was one picture, just a, a, just this of, of forgiveness. But then I saw, some, I saw, I don't know if it was a man or a woman, they had this little monkey on their shoulder. And he was cute, but deceptively cute because that was your guilt. And you've become so familiar with carrying a weight of guilt that it's just, it's just normal to you now. And again, if that's you, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit's going, you, it's you. And, and so I'm just saying, if that's you, tonight the Lord's saying, I want to take that weight away from you. So if that's you, I would encourage you. And again, it's just, it's going to be confessing that to the Lord. So Andrew, go for it, bud. There we go. Um, ever since we started, my name is Casey, by the way. Um, ever since we started this series on uh, resilience, um, there's been a scripture that's coming back to mind for me from a study that I did what seems like a lifetime ago now that really touched me. And the Lord has been prompting me to bring that forward, and I've been fighting with myself about it um, to the point that, okay, I'll print it off and I'll put it in my purse. <laughs> and then everything that Michael said tonight about um, just, you know, resilience is about your relationship with the Lord. And, and then he talked about having the conversation and the conversations that you have with the Lord. And so this scripture is from the message uh, version, and it is Psalm 169 uh, through 176, Psalm 119. And so this is for someone that needs to just be able to have a conversation with their dad. Hmm. Lord, let my cry come right into your presence, God. Provide me with the insight that comes only from your word. Give my request your personal attention. Rescue me on the terms of your promise. Let praise cascade off my lips. After all, you've taught me the truth about life. And let your promises ring from my tongue with every order that you've given is right. Put your hand out and steady me, since I've chosen to live by your counsel. I'm homesick, God, for your salvation. I love it when you show yourself. Invigorate my soul so I can praise you well. Use your decrees to put iron in my soul. And should I wander off like a lost sheep, seek me. I'll recognize the sound of your voice. Mm. That's awesome. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks, Casey. And you know what stood out to me about that? The phrase, and there's lots of amazing phrases in that, but the, I am homesick. And do you know you can be homesick and live in the house? You can be homesick and be, you know, here and be apart, but still not be, there's something that's keeping you from stepping into it with God, stepping into, is keeping you arm's distance from God. And so if you're here tonight, you know, or you're watching online and you're just feeling that the weight of something, there's some barrier between you and God, just know that, that God doesn't want that anymore with you. He's never wanted that to be in between you and him. So, so I just encourage you to get prayer for that. Awesome. We're going to go back into one more song. And I would just encourage you, if you want prayer for anything, just put your hand up and someone will come and pray for you. So any takers, let me just, just to make sure, just want to throw your hand up. We went back here, back there.
But please look around you. If you see someone around you with their hand up, I just head over, make sure everyone's got their hand up has, is getting prayer. Still a gentleman. I think it's a gentleman in the back. Okay, let's worship. Make sure everyone's getting prayer. Uh, let's go back into worship, and then we'll end off the service.
pray that what we've just sung, just uh, phrases trying to describe who you are. I pray that we would take those in our hearts as we go. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Lord, I pray this week that we would have a, a stronger sense of your presence, less a sense of being alone. I pray this week that, that we really would uh, be more aware of you, hear your voice more, be led by you. I thank you that you are working in all of our lives. Lord, let me just bless you. Thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, don't forget, Rosenwald's Pizza Party. I think I smelt it. Uh, in the youth room, right through these doors, or you can go around, so they'll be heading over there right away. We also, if you're newer in the church and uh, want to check out Quick Connect, I'll be heading back to the cafe uh, through the curtains there in about three minutes. So bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that what you saw and heard was both encouraging and challenging to you. Here at The Vineyard, we believe that Jesus really is the answer. If you have any questions about him or about the church, please don't hesitate to email us at info at vcdc.org. Again, thanks so much for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful week.